Hey, this is Frank with Infinite Red. In our last video, we showed you how to make the Textables app in less than 15 minutes using Ignite 2.0. In this video, Gantt Labord is going to show you how to hook up that same app so that it gets its data from an API endpoint. We grabbed our data from this local fixtures file when what we really want to do is something a little bit more like this, where we can go ahead and hit some kind of API endpoint and then get back some kind of list of data that we can update, and then all the applications will update when they grab that particular piece of data. Now, another thing that's different about this is that we could always continue to use code push. Maybe we'll cover something like that in a future episode. But for now, let's take a look at solving this solution with the API way, right? So let's go ahead and copy this particular set for this copy API. Now, we're gonna cover some really interesting aspects of Ignite here. First thing we're gonna do is load up Reactatron. Reactatron gives us the ability to go ahead and identify some really cool stuff that's happening inside of our application while we're looking at it. Uh, we're gonna use Reactatron to identify what's going on inside of our API. Now, if we go to our application here, you can see that we already have um, a service for the API. So let's look at our structure of the application. We have a services folder, and one of them is API. And if we take a look at this, uh, it's currently set up to hit github.com and do some example, simple, three different calls. We're gonna go ahead and set our navigation, our app navigation, to be back to our launch uh, screen. And now if we look here, we can actually go back to um, the API testing. And when we click on these different pieces, we get these API results. So it comes with one API already installed, but we're gonna go ahead and modify this one. Instead of to hit GitHub, we're gonna modify it to go ahead and hit our API endpoint. So what we'll do here is we'll go to our API, and then we're going to start off with a base URL. Um, so let's go ahead and grab here. Now normally this would be the root uh, of where you would hit. And then uh, let's say that down to the file, let's say this is the uh, the parameter. Everything we're going to hit is going to be inside of RN textables, right? So we'll say it here. And then we'll say we'll have this one called uh, get faces. And then we can get rid of this guy and this guy. And so when we say we're going to get faces, we're going to go ahead and hit this particular endpoint. And that'll be our function that gets that portion of it. Um, you can see that we have steps here to kind of explain the process. You can uh, check through it, and then you can see exactly where it's tying in with Reactatron inside of here as well. And then so this will become um, just one set of functions, get faces. This is the only one that we're going to expose inside of our create function here. So now we have an API. It has one function, and that function is to go ahead and get faces. Um, now when Ignite ships, it's going to have a couple of things that come with it. You have a fixture API, right? Uh, the fixture API is for being offline. So one of the things that you're going to use here is that if we want to keep our fixtures set, this is great for testing. We go faces, JSON, we'll change this to get faces. So we're just modifying the existing API that came in those three functions, and now we're actually simplifying it down to one function. Um, and we have that set there. And this will go ahead and pull, uh, if we ever turn fixtures on, either for tests or simply because we have multiple developers hitting the same API endpoint, don't want to cross the threshold of uh, over pulling that API, we can go ahead and use fixtures and it'll load what's in the file instead. So now uh, we have our API set. We can call this particular function. It will go out, it will hit the endpoint and return that there. So we're pretty set and straightforward, but Let's not put this in our code first. Let's go ahead and use our API testing screen, just like we saw a moment ago. We have an API testing screen. So one of the advantages of having a development screen is it sits outside of your app. Here it is, the app, and here's your dev screens. Looking here at the API testing screen, you will notice that we have a grouping of functions that we can have turned immediately into buttons. So instead of uh, getting the GitHub root, here we say like get faces, and the endpoint is going to be get faces as the function it'll call, and we're not passing any kind of parameters in this one. And we'll get rid of those other buttons that you saw as well. And this is simply tied directly to that function that you saw a moment ago. So that means that when we go to our API testing screen, 
we have one button now. I would click it, and there you go. We've got our results back identified inside a touchable opacity, so we click it, it goes away. Additionally, inside of Reactatron, let me load this up. Let's go ahead and reload our app. You can see here, when we go to this particular spot, we can actually watch the API result show up here inside of Reactatron. Click, and there we go. So we have a cool little way of seeing it here, but when we're not using this as deeper inside the app, every time we have an API response, if we have the Reactatron logging on as well, we can click into it, and this is a bit more advanced. We can see the response. We can see it in an object structure. We can see the response headers, and then also we can see our request headers. So this is fantastic once it's deeply embedded in the app. But for the simple function of testing here, we can see immediately that our function does work. Uh, we're able to get the results that we want. So now that we have this particular uh, function working and we're able to see it inside the screen, all we have to do is use that data instead of the one from the other call. So we'll go to this screen here and we're currently pulling the objects from there, right? But I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that we can see that we're getting this data. Now, it might not be a bad idea to have some temporary information on the screen immediately show up, but I'm just gonna go ahead and kneecap it right here. So the only thing that we will see has to come in from the server. Otherwise, the screen will be completely empty. We'll go back to our navigation and return this back to our default screen. And you can see here, we don't even have enough to push to the bottom of the screen. So now that I've gone ahead and made the textable screen load with no rows whatsoever, um, it actually kind of dies out quickly and we have nothing on the screen. There's nothing to even scroll beyond. Okay, now let's go ahead and move in our API instead. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do here is expose this uh, data source. And I wanna mention this whole use of the data source and the clone with rows and sections is probably going to eventually be uh, advanced into just reading directly from an array with the new flat list. But for now, uh, the flat list I think is still an experimental phase, so we're going to go ahead and use the traditional method. And this sort of uh, entire data source logic that we're doing here will just go away and it'll become even simpler as uh, React Native continues to grow. So instead of having a little private set up for the data source here. I'll just go ahead and attach it on the top, and then this will continue to allow us to use the data source in a separate function because now it's attached to the entire uh, component. And so um, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna write a little function. Let's, let's import our API up here at the top. Services, API. There we go. So now we have our API coming in, and we can use it inside of a friendly function here. So we'll go ahead and say something like uh, get data, and um, we could be using promises. Uh, as you are well familiar, we have promises that are used um, for, for our API calls, but I really like the new async syntax. So I'm gonna go ahead and flatten out our promises so it's not one big wall. Then we can use try and catch to go ahead and get the errors that promises normally would swallow. I think it's a lot more friendly. So I'm gonna go ahead, uh, make an API object here, which equals the API.create, and this will create the API on this particular screen. Now this isn't a major violation in this particular case because we have a one screen app, but we're gonna talk for a minute later on how to do this better. Okay, let's grab the faces that will be um, using await here. API get faces. Leaves the name of the function that we have. And this will go off and get it. Now the await will simply uh, grab the then on this promise and then store it here. So this will block until uh, this is moved on. So I don't actually have to move into a thinner uh, block there. Now I'll use this dot set state. Now technically here, I think the best practice is to go ahead and use state and props as a, um, as a function here. And then having the function return a new object. So that way you're fine. But we're not gonna actually modify any state or any props or do any kind of logic based on state or props. So I'm still a big fan of just tossing an object in here. Uh, I've heard this might be going away in React 16, but it's not something we really have to worry about at this time. So I'll say data source, I think is the name of it. This.ds, clone with rows and sections. And then we'll say 
faces.data, which is what came back on this particular object. Uh, I think we could have seen that pretty cleanly here. You can see the data that's coming back on this particular response. Okay, so now get data. We'll go ahead and take the new information and then update our data source here. I'll move this, and what we'll do is right at the end of our constructor here, I'll just go ahead and call it this.get data. There we go. And now if we take a look at our app, We'll refresh here. There we go. You saw nothing, and then it automatically came in. This is loading straight from actual API from the server. Now if we refresh it again, you saw for a millisecond there was nothing, and then it pulled in the actual data from the server. It's not a terribly long res uh, API response. It's cached because I'm using raw git. Okay, so now our application is actually using API. Um, this works perfectly on iOS and Android and it was added in under five minutes. But one of the things I want to mention before we kind of move on is we don't have, coming from a server, the uh, ability to favorite a particular item or be able to choose different pieces here and then also to persist this information because what happens if uh, we don't have an actual good call from here or let's say the call takes a little bit longer. Um, and let's say that maybe we want to do API calls on different sections. This is when we're going to get into Redux and uh, probably implement the solution for the side effects in Sagas. But that'll be in a future video. That's it for this video. Be sure to check us out at infinite.red and community.infinite.red for further questions and discussion.